everyone. Um, I forgot that the first slide was a joke. Um, so my name's Allison Parrish. I'm a poet and computer programmer, and I'm an assistant arts professor at New York University's Interactive Telecommunications Program. Um, today I want to describe a machine learning model I made that spells and sounds out words and show some of the mischief I've gotten up to with this model. Um, but first I have a bit of uh, literary, historical, anthropological context. I've been researching the use of sound in poetry, so naturally I've been researching nonsense words. One of the best known examples of made up nonsense words in English literature is Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky, which I have excerpted here. What's interesting about this poem is that the words like grillig and gimbal and outgrabe were all invented for the purpose of this poem, but regardless, they seem to suggest meaning by virtue not just of the contents they, of the context they occur in, but also in the way that they sound. In other words, as Alice remarks in Jabberwocky, about Jabberwocky in Through the Looking Glass, um, even though it doesn't quote unquote make sense, somehow it feels, fills my head with ideas. Um, the idea that the sound of words alone can fill your head with ideas is otherwise known as phonesthetics or sound symbolism. Um, and I want to show a couple of uh, examples of sound symbolism as it's found in anthropology and history and the literary arts, just so you get some idea of what I'm talking about. Studies of synesthesia have shown that people from all around the world um, that are native speakers of many different languages have something in common, which is if you ask which shape is kiki and which shape is booba, people will always answer, not always, but usually will answer this way. Um, kiki is a sharp angular word, booba is a round bulbous word. This is a kind of sound symbolism. Um, to take an example from literature, celebrated fantasy author J.R.R. Tolkien, um, famously invented a number of languages in the process of composing his Lord of the Rings novels. The words and names in these books are known for their sound symbolism. So, sound symbolism. so for example, Lothlorien, um, the fairest realm of the elves remaining in Middle-earth, it's a liquid and mellifluous word, while Ashnazg Thrakatuluk, uh, meaning one ring to bind them all with its awkward consonant clusters and harsh stops, um, forms part of the inscription of the nefarious one ring. The idea that the phrase cellar door is especially beautiful in English um, predates Tolkien, but it's often attributed to him. Um, in his essay, English and Welsh, uh, Tolkien insists that on the immediate and acute pleasure in the reception or imagination of a word form which is felt to have a certain style and the attribution to it of a meaning which is not received through it. In other words, sound filling heads with ideas. Um, Sophia Samatar, um, who wrote, these are my favorite um, fantasy novels ever, maybe my favorite novels ever, um, A Stranger in a Laundry and the Winged Histories describes a similar process when inventing uh, languages for her novels. To invent the name, she says, I chose small chunks of sound that seemed pretty to me and played with combining them. Um, and I imagine this process works in similar ways for other fantasy novels, uh, fantasy authors. If you take this idea of inventing words for their phonetic properties to its extreme, you get sound poetry a form of poetry that emphasizes the sound of speech and dismisses the importance of conventional syntax and semantics as principles to organize talk. Um, this is an excerpt from duet, I Gassing Rin Jalamund, a sound poem by artist and Dada poet Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven. Um, I love this poem. I don't have time to read it, but I would love to perform this. Um, but I want to be able to generate poems like this with a computer. Um, in any case, the point of phonesthetics, sound symbolism, and sound poetry is that they facilitate linguistic phenomena and forms of expression impossible with other forms of writing. Sound poetry scholar Steve McCaffrey states it like this, the acoustic poem bypasses the cortex and addresses itself to the central nervous system. Energy transmits as fragmented linguistic particles, sound, vibration, and electrochemical forces to the spinal column. In other words, somehow it seems to fill my head with ideas, but not just my head, my entire body, sound is the part of language that activates the body, both on the part of the speaker and the listener. So why write a computer program to generate poems like this? Um, Elsa von Freitag, Loringhoven did fine without one. Um, but for me, making programs that generate poetry is a way of investigating aesthetic ideas, of figuring out how a poem or a type of poem works. As Emily Short puts it, um, it's a subjective process of uncovering unarticulated aesthetic preferences and getting the machine to recapitulate them. Importantly, this is a process of understanding, not one inherently of automation. I'm trying to be a sound po poet, not put sound poets out of a job. Um, there is a problem, though, and it doesn't necessarily show up great here. Um, this is a screenshot of what Keynote shows me when I'm editing this presentation. Um, there are two problems. One is that uh, this shows how computers perpetuate the idea that some words are correct and some words are wrong, those little red squiggles, right? Um, the squiggles are a pretty severe hindrance, I think, to being able to express yourself with writing. It's saying, like, these words aren't normal words. 
Um, but the second problem, and this is the main thing that concerns me in the talk today, is this. How did Lewis Carroll or J.R.R. Tolkien or Sophia Samatar or Baroness Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven decide how to spell their nonsense words? Um, to answer that question, we need to ask, what even is spelling? Uh, we'll limit our discussion to languages with alphabetic writing systems and maybe just to English um, for now. Um, there's a common sense view that spelling is just transcription. It's making a record of a speech event. You hear the sounds, um, you write down the symbols that correspond to those sounds, follow conventions of spelling that you learn in grade school, like I before E except after C. Um, and even though these conventions can be complicated, especially in English where there's really no clear relationship between the way the words sound and the way they're written, um, from a formal standpoint, the common sense view is that the task itself is just input, processing, output. But in reality, spelling is expressive and creative and shaped by context. It's something that we do tactically in every situation which, in which we have to produce text. Um, this is a paper by um, Janis Andrustopoulos, um, who brings up a number of examples of creative uses of spelling, um, changing spelling to reflect phonetics, changing spelling to simulate word stress, uh, changing spelling for social purposes, like replacing U with the letter U, U or um, eight in skater or elite speak also belongs to this category of creative variety of spelling. My eventual goal is to make a program that can turn all of the strategies in this model into parameters using um, a spelling sounding up process. Um, and an important thing to note here is that these expressive spelling strategies are only meaningful in contrast to some existing standard or expectation of how spelling should work. Um, and I put standard in huge scare quotes, the biggest quotes I could find in Unicode, um, <laughs> to emphasize that standard doesn't mean normal or good. I think it's fair to say that English is taught in a certain way across the world, so readers and writers of English share some common knowledge about how spelling is supposed to work, and I think for um, machine learning model purposes, um, it's a good place to start would be with these standard spelling rules. Um, so the first thing to do is to figure out how to make a program that can spell words, by which I mean converting sounds to letters, and a program that can sound words out, converting letters to sounds. Um, orthography is just a fancy way of saying how a word is spelled, and phonology is just a fancy word for how words sound. Um, there's a resource that makes this process easier. This is the CMU Pronouncing Dictionary, which provides a list of over 100,000 English words along with phonetic transcription in something called the ARPABET, which is named after DARPA, the Defense uh, Department of Defense uh, Agency, um, which is where this list comes from, as Nabil um, referenced earlier. I urge you to read his blog post on the topic. Um, so you think with this resource in hand, it should be pretty easy to sound out words. You just look them up in the dictionary. It's that, that easy. Um, but there are problems with that. First, and importantly, this is just for one variety of English. It's just that sort of nameless standard, uh, standard North American uh, Midwestern English. So it doesn't cover all varieties of English. Um, and I want to emphasize that the official status of these particular spellings and the particular pronunciations is contingent and externally enforced. Um, but a second problem is that the dictionary is fixed. It only has a set number of words, so it will allow us neither to spell nor to sound out words that are not in the dictionary. So using the dictionary to analyze Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven sound poetry, which consists mostly of words that aren't in the CMU pronouncing dictionary, like Actas Wasnox, um, would get us nowhere. So neural networks to the rescue. Um, what we need is a statistical model of what letter will come next in a word given some phonetic information. The kind of model that can do this is called a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, and this is what I've been playing with for the past little while. Um, I'm not the first person to work with sequence-to-sequence -sequence models for this kind of thing, and I've added a bunch of references that I've made use for, especially the Kira sequence-to-sequence -sequence example code, um, which has been uh, invaluable. Um, but I think there's a couple of things about my, my model architecture and my applications that are, that are interesting. So here's very briefly how a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model works. First, you have an encoder that takes a sequence in language A and converts it to a feature vector, a fixed-length vector. Then you have a decoder which takes a sequence in language B and predicts the next item in the sequence using that feature vector from language A to condition that process. If you combine the two, you get a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model in which you input paired sequences in language A and language B, and you get back language B with one more word in the sequence. Usually, this is used for machine translation purposes, like you put in English sentences and Chinese sentences that are translations of the English sentences, or vice versa, and you get out a system that appears to translate from English to Chinese. What I'm doing is I'm saying language A is spelling, language B is phonemes, or language A is phonemes, names and language B is spelling. This is what my data looks like when I'm training the models. I'm using phonetic features instead of whole phonemes so I can capture some of that underlying, um, underlying information about the phonemes themselves. Um, and this is what my model looks like. Um, it's a phoneme, a round trip grapheme to phoneme to grapheme uh, model. 
um, which seems kind of useless, like it's spelling out the thing that we already knew how to spell. But what this allows me to do is sort of um, guide the process or interrupt the process at various points in the pipeline in order to change um, the way that the output looks. And I'm gonna show a couple of examples of that. Um, and uh, this is a, going to be a live demo. The first thing my mother ever told me was never do a live demo. Um, <laughs> sorry, mom, I'm going to break that rule. Um, so this is a little a Jupyter Notebook uh, interface to the model. Um, and what this allows me to do is change the um, probabilities of letters being produced in the spelling or sounds being produced in the sounding out. So one thing I can do is I can just decrease the um, uh, probability of E's occurring, and it says spilling words with machine learning. I can get rid of all of the vowels, actually, and we'll try to spell the same phrase without using any vowels. Um, and it gets pretty close <laughs> with machine learning. Um, I can reload this to get the things back. I can decrease the probability of any word ending. So if I decrease the probability of the ending token, then it just sort of keeps spelling words until it's good and ready to stop spelling. <laughs> um, or I can do things like um, increase the, uh, the sound er in the, in the text. So I get Spurlers, Wordlers, Word, Fifth Mercer, Learnering. Um, or maybe make this like a bunch of front vowels, front high vowels. And we get squeeing weirdies if you eat ting learning. So I can put in words and then get back out spellings that have um, phonetic properties that are desirable to me for artistic purposes. Um, let's continue with the presentation here. So I have a few other things that I want to show here. Um, using this system, you can rewrite an entire text to make it sound like you have a head cold. So this is um, uh, the King James Version of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Um, you can generate new magic words by um, inferring to the phoneme vector and then adding random noise to the phoneme vector and then reproducing them or, or spelling them out. So this is abracadabra plus uh, normally distributed noise. Um, you can find the average, you can generate a new word that is halfway in between other words. In other talks I've shown another solution to this, but halfway between paper and plastic is pasidi, kitten, uh, kitten pup, pup, pee, puppy, birthday, Arthur day, anniversary, artificial, intellificial, uh, intellificial, intelligence. Um, and then there's sort of this like um, phonetic resizing thing that I'm working on where you can take the sound of the text um, infer the phonetic vectors and then resize the text and then generate new words from the resized version. So this is all of the sounds of this text on the left but reduced to half size. And this is all of the sounds of this text um, expanded to um, twice the size. I'm just gonna read like a little short bit of this. I know that I'm over time. Um, Any thee to beginning, 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 God crowed, creed thee, the, he, heaven, hand, and de thee, fear, earth, Aunt and fade the hearth earth ours was which show without four hot form om and vide void vode and ink med darkness dorsus was a son upon oof thee thus face foos off he thee thee deep aid and hand sits and so forth so forth so forth. Um, so it lets me do these um, interesting sound poetry things just by applying mathematical operations to the model which is um, where I wanted to be when I started out. Um, that's what I've been working on um, and I'm hoping to release all of this as open source software soon. I want to leave you with this quote. Um, part of the idea of this project is to point out all the ways that standard spelling is absurd and arbitrary to help us understand and name the systems of knowledge and power in how words are spelled. Um, to quote um, uh, Jaffe and, Shan uh, and Walton here, um, no transcriptions of speech, even close phonet phonetic ones, are ever neutral or transparent depictions of what someone said or how they sounded. Orthography is one of the key sites where the very notion of standard language is pleased. So I hope this talk has helped you think about the relationship between sound and spelling and meaning, and it, about what exactly you're doing when you're spelling, and about the ways that spelling as a practice can be both a way to shut down express expressiveness and to unlock it. Um, and here's my contact information, that's all, thank you.